this week or at least the past couple of days have been very, very, very eventful to say the least. The country has been moved into lockdown level four by the president. And then we have a former president who was moved into lockdown level 10, 11, 12, 13, maybe for the next 15 months. So, and also on top of that, not to get too political, but some of us would like to celebrate and bottle stores are closed. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a lose win, not a uh, win, 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 lose. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> But, but as always, good to have both our experts with us. Yeah, maybe before we get started, I just want to extend my condolences to... Um, uh, Marisha and and her family for the passing away of her dad Albert. Um, yeah, uh, he was he was an amazing person. He'd been in the the construction game and uh, property inspection game for many many years. Um, like there's no one like him. He just knew everything. And you can see in the way that Marisha like you know runs the business that she did take a lot from him. Uh, he is going to be sorely missed. And yeah, I just want to send out my wishes to the family. Um, yeah, and yeah, extend my condolences. Yeah, it's shame you, for bro. me to Marisha. Um, really, uh, I I didn't know your dad that well, but uh, I I fondly remember the conversations I've had with him at the uh, property shows, and he told me stuff about roofs and uh, all sorts of things around construction and and buildings that I never knew. So, so we're really thinking of you and, and your family and our, our sincere condolences. Thank you, Sana. Thank you, Bruno. Condolences to Marisha and her family. Um, just to get underway with today's webinar, uh, we have now, obviously, like I mentioned, and like everybody knows, we've moved into lockdown level four. And with that movement in terms of lockdown levels, which we seem to be going through very often, um, mm -hmm. there comes a lot of confusion. And that confusion also then will, 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 will flow around the way that we deal with or the way that the law, the way the applicability of the law. Um, so I think we want to move, well, firstly, into the first question. There's, there's also the, the, the element of P coming in, but I think I, I'm going to get to that at a later point. But let's first get into the lockdown, the lockdown level four uh, topic for today. And I want to find out, or the question is rather, um, can I move residents and business if I live in Gauteng, because we understand Gauteng to be locked down, uh, under lockdown level four? Solna, uh, any word on that? Yes, definitely. Uh, Bruno and I are definitely in Gauteng. Chris, I, I never know where you are. I'm, I'm guessing you're not in Gauteng. Because no. I saw, yeah, exactly. You can see a Gauteng and you can spot a Gauteng on a mile currently. We are. <laughs> very much in lockdown, like a <laughs> proper hard lockdown. Um, yes, so so that's a question I got uh, from quite a few concerned um, estate agents, especially because it's the last day of the month. So a lot of uh, new lease agreements uh, commencing and lease agreements terminating. So a lot of people moving around this time of the month. Can we move? Yes, everybody can. Even to and from Gauteng. Remember, the only prohibition on Gauteng is no leisure travel for Gauteng as I see stuff. Uh, we'll keep the economy going while everybody else can go on leave. Um, <laughs> we're staying put. But you're not allowed to, to, uh, to come into Gauteng for leisure travel because, you know, nothing like a lack of holiday in Sandton. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no leisure travel to Gauteng and no leisure tra tra travel out of Gauteng. But all movement through Gauteng is allowed. So if you, I had a question from a, a, one of our agents in Secunda yesterday um, asking me if she has to go from Secunda to um, somewhere close to Hartis, which is Northern Province, is she allowed to travel through Gauteng? And yes, you are very much allowed to travel through Gauteng. So traveling through Gauteng is allowed. Moving in Gauteng is allowed. Moving from another province into Gauteng is allowed and moving from Gauteng to another province is allowed. And this is uh, for business as well as residents. 
So if you are moving here, welcome and enjoy the lockdown. It's fun this year. We are now baking banana bread again. Um, so you, are, uh, you can um, move anything, businesses, residents, absolutely anything is allowed to, to move. No permits required, um, like we did in the, in the initial first uh, lockdown level four. No permits required. What I do, however, recommend is if you do um, move, if you are moving, just have a copy of your lease agreement available so you can show this is what happened. If you are traveling for leisure purposes and you have to travel through Gauteng, just have your booking printed out so you can show if you are pulled over for some reason what yeah. you are doing and where you are going. Uh, but honestly, from, from the stuff we've seen the past three weeks, Bruno, um, I think you'll agree with me, which is why we are we both have our offices pretty much closed. Um, this is no joke, guys, and it's it's really not fun uh, being cutting right now. We've been at home like super proper locked up. Um, so even though you can uh, maybe consider just sitting tight for a little bit. Me too. No, thanks, Elna. Um, I think moving on to the next question, which also now, again, the confusion comes in. And uh, I think there's a lot of confusion across all different, uh, you know, areas, people and so forth. And the question is, can evictions be carried out under lockdown level four? Um, it's going to be an open discussion, but let's start with Bruno and then we'll take it from there. Sure. Excellent. I think um, I think a nice story to actually preface that question is the story that Soma was uh, telling me about uh, one of her candidate attorney's experiences in court earlier this week. Uh, Soma, I don't know if you just want to touch on that quickly. Yes, thanks. I think it's a brilliant story. So uh, Kelsey, one of our candidate attorneys, uh, went to court Monday morning. So obviously we moved to lockdown level four only Sunday evening. Uh, Monday morning, uh, Kelsey had an eviction in Bradburg Magistrate Court. She went to court um, to obtain her order. And the magistrate said, no, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, that you missed the president's speech last night. We can't do evictions now. And luckily, um, she had a copy of the uh, already gazetted regulations on her phone. So she handed up her phone and said, uh, Your Worship, no, we can't very much do evictions. And her order was actually granted. I'm super proud. Well done, Kelsey. Um, now I'm just bragging blatantly with with yes. my candidate attorney. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I think it's a very good story um, because, I mean, uh, the magistrate said we can't do evictions and we had to show um, the regulations to, to, to say it is allowed. So, Bruno, that was my story. You can take it further from there. <laughs> Yeah, no. So, I mean, I think I think uh, as soon as you mentioned it, it was just such a clear example of the confusion uh, that's out there at the moment, just in general with everything. People don't understand what level four is, um, you know, what adjustment means. Uh, if you Google some of the regulations, you land up with commentary on last year's level four versus this year's level four. I mean, to the point where we even had issues with um some of our attorney associations themselves are sending out uh, sending out notices um, um, regarding how the courts will approach matters in terms of level four, uh, but dating dating back to directives from last year um, that don't really apply practically this year. I, I and I mean honestly, um, the the use of the terminology level four versus the adjustments actually made, it's, it, it is confusing because uh, people understood level four to be a certain level, but we're not actually at level four anymore. It almost shouldn't have the same name because last year's level four was very different to this year's level four. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there needs to be a level of clarity. And for those people that struggle to read uh, through the Government Gazette, even those that do read through the Government Gazette, uh, you know, no one quite understands what the slight differences are. So from an eviction perspective, um, very little has changed. Uh, the, the bottom line is, and in fact, even through last year's regulations, same thing applied. 
the courts can order evictions. The courts can order evictions. Um, so I think that was left as a discretion to the court, which is one nice thing. So everything else is very well regulated. And then as per normal, um, when it comes to courts and what courts can and cannot do, they kind of just leave it and go, well, you know what, let the judges decide that they're in a better position. Well, let a magistrate decide they'd be in a better position. So as opposed to trying to regulate the judiciary, they give us just things to think about. So in order for uh, order to be granted or not get granted or rather suspended, uh, so a, a magistrate or a judge can suspend the execution of an order um, and to decide whether they will suspend or not, there's a whole bunch of factors that they're going to consider and it's left in their discretion. So that's kind of where we are with the eviction, the, the academic interpretation of the regulations and whether we can or can't, right? Um, now, the question, so then a few little questions pop up after this. Number one, the consideration by the magistrates. Now that we're in level four, are they going to be very open and willing to grant eviction orders? Are they going to be more reluctant? Are they going to look at these considerations as um, greater hurdles or obstacles than they did in the past, even though things are similar? There's no new consideration. So how are they going to view these? Secondly, access to courts. So we need to ask ourselves, how easy is it to actually go out and get those eviction orders, especially in magistrate's court? Our high courts, a lot of stuff is being done virtually. So that's still okay. Uh, our magistrate's courts are going to be problematic because last year it was a disaster. Uh, getting court dates in magistrate's courts, getting things issued, uh, you know, trying to get a date, it, it, like you couldn't. Eventually, a lot of us just moved our stuff over to high court. So access to courts. And then even if you're lucky enough to get into court, get a magistrate to grant the order, whether you'd actually be able to execute that order through the use of the sheriff's offices. Um, so I think those are just three factors that play into this. Um, Solna, let me give you a turn. I think, I think I've had my five minutes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so introduction, you've got three, three <laughs> topics there. <laughs> Thanks, Bria. Now, uh, we've seen the same thing, I must say, um, no, exactly to your point, we have had quite a few sheriffs that said they're more than happy to, to execute our eviction orders, but they can't right now because they're short staffed. The deputies are sick. Um, and uh, remember, uh, just for the benefit of our viewers, only the sheriff may serve court papers and only the sheriff may execute court orders. And so you usually have a sheriff with uh, that's authorized in a specific district. And he then has deputy sheriffs uh, who go out and, and do the things. But the sheriff isn't allowed to appoint random person X to go and do his job. You must have certain qualifications and you must re be registered with the board of sheriffs to be able to be a sheriff. And there isn't many sheriffs. Um, and so that's a problem that we are having because currently, and I've seen this with, with the sheriffs that we usually use, Bruno, I mean, like Kempton, Halfway House, um, someone else, um, which I can't recall, but, but Joburg area. And um, they just don't have the deputies or sick, so they can't go out and serve the process. So that is, that is a problem we're seeing. At court, same thing. Um, We've decided to move many of our matters to the High Court at this stage for the benefit of case lines, as you rightly said. Thank goodness we recently had a lovely uh, court order um, from the Supreme Court of Appeal. We've had issues, um, again, just for the benefit of the viewers, we've had issues where you approach the High Court and the judge ends up saying, but why are you in front of me in the High Court where the magistrate's court does have jurisdiction? Why don't you go to the magistrate's court? And um, there was a lot of dispute around that. And the Supreme Court of Appeal now clarified the position and said, High Court, with all respect, if a matter is in front of you, you have jurisdiction, hear the matter and grant the order. The way we deal with, oh, but you could have been in match court, is grant an appropriate cost order. Cost order. So grant your cost order on match court scale. And I think I've always been a, a big fan of um, the, the answer on limitation of access to justice when you go to the high court is in the hands of the attorneys. Um, often, for instance, <clears throat> have no difference 
chain of seats, whether you go to a high court or match court. Um, and I, I think that is the case with, with most firms that understands that not everybody can afford high court orders, but something that's very important um, to know is it's not necessarily in the best interest of, um, of, of everybody to go to the match, but it might be quicker in the high court. So it's very important um, to keep that in mind. So evictions are happening. We are getting our orders. Everything is going smoothly, except um, that it is delayed. And, and I think it's important to know we as attorneys can't do anything um, to, to move it along quicker. We can't force a court date. Um, we can't force the sheriff to do something. Um, but it is going um, and we are moving moving ahead. And, and still the answer is, if you have a problem tenant, for instance, or an illegal occupant, the best answer at this stage is to, to get to the right firm and get going with the eviction as <clears throat> quick as possible. The moment an eviction gets opposed at this stage, it's a drama. I promise it's going to be much longer than we initially anticipated. Opposed evictions are taking much longer at this stage. And um, if you've disconnected the utility supply or you've done a lockout or whatever, you and the tenant aren't going to be friends yet. And uh, there will be a stronger opposition. So play nice and, and follow the law at this stage, but we are getting our orders, so don't stress about it. Um, so just to touch, uh, sorry, so just to touch on one one thing that Solna mentioned. So uh, sheriffs are struggling because of capacity, people being sick. So the reality is it's hitting a lot closer to home. The last time it was a question of, oh, but, you know, yes, COVID is out there, but it's uh, surprising enough, especially in Gauteng. So I'm not in any way underplaying this, but in Gauteng, and especially for us, we did not feel the same impact, even though the numbers were similar in December and the numbers, uh, you know, to a certain degree. Now in Gauteng, well, every second person, um, every second friend. So, uh, you know, whoever felt that back then, you know, you have my my kind of sympathy because I don't think we, a lot of us didn't realize the impact. Uh, but especially with this variant and things like that, it is quite worrisome. But the reality is every second person is impacted. So most offices are actually closed because of infection or contraction, as opposed to just being closed for safety. Um, so that's that's the first thing. But what's a very, also a very interesting thing that we just need to bear in mind is also interpretation of regulations, which is why we wanted to clarify uh, what can and can't be done. And I'm hoping that this video will be shared enough for people to, to start debating, questioning, putting questions up on the group, you know, sending their submissions, you know, especially around other lawyers and sheriffs and things like that, because we want clarity we want to know what's happening and one thing that i tend to find uh, that causes difficulties interpretation of existing court orders for example whether you know certain things can now be affected uh, you know it, because of the change of regulations you may find that even certain sheriffs might choose not to do it because they feel that the order doesn't provide for execution within this alert level now and i don't necessarily agree with that uh, in fact, uh, I feel that because the court granted the order, it should be enforceable. But mm. I can understand if there's an argument to say, well, it granted under this level. So at this level, it shouldn't be enforced. Uh, what we also do need to remember, and I think kind of like putting everyone's mind at ease, we're hoping this is only going to be for two weeks. Because as soon as we go back down, um, you know, things hopefully do normalize. But it, you know, we're having this conversation so that people can also plan ahead and kind of understand that get things started now. Don't expect that it's going to be two weeks and everything's going to be perfect again, because we remember last year's first three weeks that, you know, landed up going on for a <clears> bit <throat> longer. If these numbers don't drop because people aren't taking it seriously, we might be in for some other adjusted form of lockdown. Um, so let's and just anticipate things are going to keep happening. Life needs to uh, carry on. Play safe. But don't stop what you're doing. If you need to start the process, start now so that at least the ball's rolling. Even if it is going to take longer, at least you've started. Don't wait a month and then realize you've just lost an, uh, an entire month. I think that's such a such an important point, Bruno, because uh, people want to wait um, mm. for things to get better before they get started. But remember, everybody is doing that. So just get ahead of the queue. It's going to take long. 
I, I'm not even going <laughs> to yeah. sugarcoat it. But it's taking longer, but it's moving and, and yeah, the quick action is important. Cool. So, so I can't pretend to be a sheriff and, and rock up in people's houses and go like, howdy, ma'am, I'm your local sheriff and I'm here to serve these papers. No, <laughs> that can't happen. So... <laughs> it will be entertaining. It will be entertaining, it, though. It, it, it and will... strange and very strange. <laughs> I'm so, I had to. I had to break all of that seriousness with a bit of silly childishness <laughs> from me. So I apologize. But... <laughs> no, no, no. Let's, never apologize for a good giggle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's quickly move on to the next question, which is: um, May estate agents trade under lockdown level four? Uh, let's. Open it up, Solna. Yes. What do you say? Okay. That was it. Uh, yes. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bruno. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, let's move on to the next question, which is <laughs> how will viewings and inspections work um, under lockdown uh, level four? I'm going to go back to Solna. Please don't just say yes. <laughs> I, I don't have a yes for that one. The thing is, remember, um, uh, we are in a situation countrywide um, where we really need to be extra cautious. I think um, I will say this now, and and I'm not I'm not proud of this, and you guys are allowed to laugh, but I still remember when we had the first case in Durban. I was like, yeah, see. I'm safe in Gauteng. It's in Durban. I'm sure that people will be clever and leave it there. It's like, you know, not <laughs> anyway. Um, we just sometimes want uh, it. An attorney needs a very high level of almost crazy, unrealistic optimism. Otherwise, you will seriously not survive. So, uh, exactly, Bruno, when you said, let's hope it's going to be two weeks. And I said, yeah. yeah. Um, it, that's the kind of optimism you need when you're an attorney. So uh, uh, what what I really want to caution everybody about is as much as we feel it's very hard in cutting right now, like seriously, uh, if you're not in cutting, what, what we're experiencing right now isn't what we experienced in the first and the second wave. It's not pretty. It is absolutely horrific. Either people are sick, no people that sick, or they're mm. mourning the passing of, of friends and family, it's really no no joke currently in Gauteng. It is pretty chaotic. Um, so for everybody else, don't take my advice now, just if you're in Gauteng. Everybody, if you do an inspection or if you do a listing or a viewing, take my advice, even if you feel like you're in a safe area, be overly cautious. So all of these are allowed. What I recommend though is Keep it as simple as possible. If you can do a virtual inspection, do that. There's amazing software out there. Um, I will share again a video uh, that I've done in, uh, last year at this time about um, on virtual inspections. Um, I'll share that on the group uh, a little later. Um, you, can uh, you can watch that again. Basically, what we're saying is, do the inspection, but don't be 50 people. You only need the landlord and the tenant or the agent on behalf of the landlord and the tenant. Don't be the agent and the landlord and the tenant and the tenant's sister and the tenant's uncle and then the landlord's auntie just for good measure. The, stick to two people and stay two meters away for, from each other. Masks aren't made to wear when people can see you. Masks are made so you can keep your own virus to yourself and not spread it around. Wear your mask, sanitize, ideally stay outside. So what the agent, for instance, walk through, fill in the form, now to have a conversation outside in the air, two meters apart from each other while you are wearing your mask. Then let the other party go through and, and see what they, um, what they see. Viewings, you don't really need an agent next to you to do a viewing um, unless it's a very funny house and somebody might fall off somewhere, which is then anyway not safe. Um, so viewings doesn't have to be together. The agent can open and be there. Um, but I definitely recommend um, uh, less people and 
highly ventilated. If you're in Cape Town right now, I see so, um, it's so wet there, you can't uh, leave one outside, but make sure you keep uh, ventilated uh, properly and wear your masks and sanitize uh, while you're doing inspections and viewings. Bruno, any wise advice from you? Sure. Um, so, uh, so I'm just thinking from from our side, like potential scenarios that could actually play out in um, in conducting viewings and inspections. Because I mean, obviously, what you're saying now is so it's so valid and so real, and it's it's good practical advice to say, guys, you know what? Let's just work together, be safe, and it's a nice pragmatic solution to it. Um, I, you know, I can't imagine a lot of. Uh, I actually had a case. When was it? It was. Oh, it was today. Like it's, it's some of the strict protocols that it, uh, some estate agencies actually put uh, put down when it comes to inspections and viewings that they've they're so strict that they've been unable to actually uh, move towards the safety of doing it virtually, and they don't understand that concept. So inspections have to be done in person, have to be done in a specific way. Viewings have to be done in person. So admittedly, there's a lot of businesses out there that are looking at, but does the law permit or not? So mm -hmm. I think the best answer to this is you guys are allowed to trade. You can do it, right? Just remember that you also need to look at it commercially, like how many people are going to be willing to do this with you? Um, are they going to be willing to actually come in the house? Uh, yes, so inspections, I do understand the difficulties there. You do need to check everything. Doing it over a camera might cause difficulties. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you are allowed to do it. You are allowed to insist on it being done. But now remember, there is still constitutional provisions regarding people's safeties. And that's where still is pragmatic advice. So this wasn't just about advising people on how to do things and be safe. We're also looking at it constitutionally. The reality is, if you're telling a tenant, well, we have to do it, and you pitch up there without a mask, to a great degree, you're looking at issues in the regulations. You're looking at issues on the way that you're doing it. If you're not keeping social distance, if you're not doing all those things, these are issues. So you're allowed to conduct your job. You're allowed to do inspections, allowed to do viewings. You're allowed to insist that it be done on person. But the regulations still apply when you're interacting with these people. So be careful with it. Um, if the person's sick, that's a completely different thing. And I suppose we'd have to look at it on a case-by-case -case scenario. But if you do have a tenant that's sick and now he's stuck and in isolation, uh, obviously, and I mean, again, logically, now you can't go, but you need to go because it's not really going to work out that well. So you're going to need to approach that uh, like, a, you know, with, with some level of logic, they would have to obviously be attended for whatever period of time he's there. Uh, doing the inspection is going to be difficult. So you can adjust around the specific needs. Legally speaking, though, you obviously would not be able to enforce uh, an inspection of this guy's house while he's sitting there sick. That's not uh, that's not mm. the way that it works. So, yeah. Um, so, so, you know, the, the legal and the pragmatic actually do fit in well, hand in hand. The regulations are there. So you're allowed to do your job. Just be careful how you actually do your job. I think, I'm sorry, Chris, I, I clearly see you have another question, but I just want to latch on to something Bruno said. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what about a tenant that tested positive and he's isolating and his disagreement comes to an end? That's actually a question I'm getting. And it's one of those things that I'm thinking, landlord, landlord, with all respect and love, but... Mm. Uh, this is sort of obvious because yeah. if somebody tested positive and is in isolation, isolation means you need to stay exactly where you are. So what I recommend, again, practical. Look at me. I'm so practical tonight. It's it's absolutely amazing. Um, practical advice there. Say, for instance, you have a tenant that should be moving out uh, tomorrow or today, and you already have another one that has to come in. The thing is, we're in the middle of an, a, a, natural, a, a state of disaster, okay? So your lease agreement will definitely say, if you as the landlord can't give occupation as a result of something out of your control, nobody can claim anything against each other. And what I recommend is the moment the tenant tells you, listen, I tested positive, go count your 14 days that the guy needs to be in isolation, Already let the incoming tenant know, listen, just sit tight. You will only be able to take occupation later. 
I do know that if you tell the incoming tenant that the guy in the property uh, tested positive and had COVID, then he's going to be a little paranoid and you, will, you know, there will have to be proper sanitization and decontamination of the property on the account of the exiting tenant. Because remember, he got the property without COVID. Now he's leaving it with COVID. He has to uncover it. So it is uh, the, the obligation is on the tenant um, to, to decontaminate. Um, but um, it's important to, to communicate throughout because you can't kick somebody out um, because his lease agreement ends, but now he has to isolate in the property. So it's very important uh, to, to think around these things and see how we can practically uh, meet each other halfway. Chris, you enjoyed the uh, un-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he coveted it, and now he must un-COVID it. <laughs> Which is true. I, I, I was freaking out around about, I didn't want to say anything, but around about the 22-minute mark or so into this thing, a spider was crawling on my shoulder. <laughs> and I, I flicked it. I don't know where it went. <laughs> it's like, go, when you watch the video again, you will see. I was panicking. I just tried to keep my calm. <laughs> but I saw your face was weird at some yeah. stage, and I thought it was, it was because fun. of the noise in the background, which was my uh, my handsome son building amazing stuff with Lego. So I just had Lego noise in the background at uh, the same time. So Bruno was the only one concentrating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but guys, thank you so much. Uh, we have reached uh, the end of tonight's webinar. Uh, for those of you who have asked questions, I've got Angelique Stein and Hans Liebenberg. Thank you so much for posing your questions. We will get through to them. It's just that today we had to discuss what was a very pertinent happening around us. Uh, in terms of lockdown level four. And uh, we definitely will get to your questions. And, and to everybody else, please do uh, pose your questions. We will get to them and, and answer them in, in next week's session. Uh, or contact our experts, Bruno Simao and Solna Stein, uh, for any of your legal matters that you might have. And I just wanted to thank both of you for the session. And uh, to our viewers, uh, please join us next week at six o'clock on Wednesday. And we're looking forward to seeing you. And